Good morning and uh, welcome to the shop again. Um, to our second uh, hand tool, tool uh, special interest group. Um, what I wanted to do today was um, do maybe a half hour presentation where I talk about some of the uh, planes that we have in the shop. And um, I've been tuning some of them up recently and been very, very uh, pleased with the results of them. So I'm gonna kind of talk about planes a little bit and the anatomy of a plane and then go through um, using some of the Lee Nielsen planes that we have in the shop. You know, we have a, 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 an outstanding set of uh, nine planes, I think seven planes that were donated to us. And uh, I tuned them up and I've been playing with them. So um, assuming that I'm talking to a wide range of, of skills and knowledge, I'm gonna just uh, go over planes a little bit, history and so on. Um, the earliest known planes that were actually um, dug up were uh, from the ruins of Pompeii in Roman times, 400 AD or so. Um, but people have been making furniture way, but there, there, there were dovetail furniture in the pharaoh's tombs, I think, pieces of furniture in the, in the pharaoh's tombs. Egyptians were doing it 2000 BC. Um, but the earliest known plane was in, among Roman times, um, and it stayed pretty much the same design right through uh, till the uh, 1800s. There were some changes and different countries came up with different designs. But in, uh, in the 1800s, a gentleman called Bailey came up with this design, which is made out of cast iron as opposed to wood, which most of it used to be. And it's a, a fairly simple design. Um, and if you look at the profile of almost any plane today, any bench plane today, it's going to follow roughly this pattern. Um, so there are various parts to a, to a plane. Um, and this is one I, I recently restored, not to perfect condition, but to working condition. Um, what I did was, this is the sole, the bottom of the plane, and this area here is the mouth where the blade actually sticks through. And I flattened this because if you want to get nice thin shavings, which you need to do if you're dealing with different grains, um, if, you, if you want to do that, you've got to have a flat surface to work with because the, the, the working area is the, is the bottom of the gap between the bottom of the blade and the bottom of the, uh, of the sole here. Um, I've forgotten the name of the front handle, but we'll call it that for the moment. Uh, this is called the tote, the rear handle, uh, obviously designed for the, the human hand. This is the cap iron, and this holds the blade in place. I, I call it a blade, the strict term is an iron, and I'm sorry, am I showing that close enough to the camera? This is the cap iron. And one takes it to pieces and then releases it. This is the actual blade. It's an old blade. It's been uh, quite extensively used in its life. It's a very small gap between here and here. Um, this one is a Type 16. It's from uh, the late 1930s, I think. And um, that's the actual blade. That's, that's, that's the piece that does the work. Everything else supports that. And then you have the chip breaker, which you set with your blade to control. You, you can alter it to, um, to uh, get different thicknesses of, of uh, depending on whether you're doing a heavy cut or a light cut. Um, okay, so next we have uh, the frog, which is, this is one of the big innovations of the Bailey planes, apart from the fact that they were in cast iron, solid cast iron as opposed to wood. But the big innovation was the frog. And in later designs, hey, Paul. Yes. Just because I've heard from both Doug and you a word that sounds like F R O G. Can you confirm that it is frog? frog? Yes, as in frog. <laughs> yes, that's what it's called. Most of the other parts seem to have an anatomical connection: sole, heel. This is the heel. This is the toe. Um, the mouth. Um, and uh, let me get the frog out here. <laughs> the frog doesn't fit that, that uh, pattern there. Right, so 
In restoring it, one of the things I did was I flattened out this area of the frog because this is where the iron or blade sets on. So I took that and flattened it on stones. You can see it's, it's acquired a kind of a, a dull flatness. <laughs> and then I also took the, the frog itself and I used bow grinding compound. Um, that you use for cut or used to use. I don't know if anyone still grinds their own bowels, but I did at one, did at one time. Um, and you basically work it back and forth until you have all these surfaces, these surfaces down here, oh, down here and here, meeting flat. So, and there's an, there's, there's an adjustment back here. Um, which once it's set in place, you loosen the two screws that hold it in slightly and move it back and forth. Which segues, so that's the basic anatomy of the plane, segues me into a really good article in this month's fine woodworkers. It's by uh, Gary Rogarski, who is a uh, very accomplished woodworker. And it's all about um, techniques for for taming tear out. In the card scraping presentation, we talked about tear out a little bit, and um, it is uh, it, it's several pages long and it's well worth a read. Um, I also like you to note that the, the brand of the tools he's using. He's using Lee Nielsen's. Um, he's a, a hand woodworker, he's uh, done a lot of interesting stuff. But I've noticed that when you see the shops of most uh, professional woodworkers, they, uh, they tend to, uh, to have Lee Nielsen planes. So I'm going to move this stuff aside and show you some of our planes that we got. One of the things that, that um, that I've also heard both uh, Gary and, um, I've forgotten his name, but another professional woodworker from back east, um, recommend is if you're going to you get one plane, get one of these, it's a low angle jack plane. Veritas and Lee Nielsen make two very high quality products. Um, they're both about the same price. The beauty of the low angle jack plane is that you can change out the blade pretty easily and you can buy these blades in different angles. So you can make this be a lot of different planes by using different angles and, uh, and um, they come, or they don't come with, but they have available something called a hot dog here, which is a piece of uh, cast aluminum or turned aluminum. And it sets on the side of here and, and works for very well with a shooting board, which we'll get to in a minute. So we were, we were given one of those. That's a really nice piece of equipment. And then this is also a number five. It's not a jack plane. It's a regular, regular 45 degree angle plane. The 45 degree angle refers to the angle that the blade is set at. You'll notice that this one has a much, much lower angle. It's 12 and a half degrees, which can present challenges if you don't have those different blades because a low angle jack plane will, with the, the standard blade, if you go against the grain, it'll rip it up beautifully, it will really make a mess of it. But if you go the other way, as you'll see in a minute, then it, it makes, does good work. Um, this is a nice, uh, again, jack planes are nice. I find I use them and block planes more than I use uh, the standard number four. Oh, actually, that's a number three. Um, so the, the other planes that we've been given are this, which is a 140. This is a very interesting plane. It's able to do a lot of different things. It is, it has a fence, which might give you a clue that it's also good for doing rabbits. You can remove this side plate here and you've got an open sided mouth. So you can use this, you can set the one of these days we'll get these camera issues. I will get these camera issues <laughs> um, sorted out. You can set the fence for a particular width of rabbit. It has right in here, what's called a nicker. It's a tiny little blade that cuts the edge for you, cuts the grain ahead of 
your main, your main skewed blade, which is also another aspect of this that's really good. Um, it was originally a Stanley design, as are all of these designs. Uh, the, the fundamental design for these is, is based on a Stanley. I've got one at home. It doesn't have anything like the quality of manufacture. And I paid $75 for it and then restored it because they, were, they haven't been made by Stanley for a long time. We were given a chisel plane. Um, I don't know why one wants a chisel plane because I've got a lot of chisels and I find them to be quite useful. Um, but uh, I have read reviews of this plane and it, people rave about it. Um, but for, I would imagine if you've got rough edges coming into your 90 degree joint or any angle joint, you could clean those out really well. Um, but to me, it's a plane without a front. <laughs> We were given a little scraper plane, which I've uh, sharpened and tuned up and I'll demo shortly. Um, interesting design because you can move the angle of the scraper. And when you actually get it tuned up, it's a lot less hassle than using a card scraper. And it does a nice job. We have left and right-handed small rabbit planes. They're, I'll demonstrate those in a minute. They're, they're really nice. Um, I'd never used one until a couple of days ago. They have an interesting two-faceted blade, so you need to sharpen two edges of that in order to get that, that nice pointed edge. These were not donated, but they fill out the range. These, this is the little brother of this guy, and was the first Lee Nielsen I bought. I was told that if, you go, if you're gonna buy anything, buy that one. And I never regretted it. It was an eye-opener to me. The first time I used this plane was, I, it just blew me away. And then this little baby is another one that I, I believe is not made anymore. Um, but I'll show you what I like to use this for right now. I don't know if you, any of you remember, but last year I was, uh, I was uh, on a bandsaw kit. And these are some of the leftovers. And one of the things I discovered whilst doing this, I think you, I've mentioned before, I hate sanding. I hate sanding, if you don't get it. <laughs> um, but this little plane is excellent for cleaning up a bandsaw box. As long as it's concave, obviously. The other thing to consider when you're working a curve is that you want to be going down the grain. So, um, This is just great because this takes off the worst. Sometimes it'll leave me with a, with, a, with a surface that's way better than sanding. And even if it doesn't, it takes out all those little ripples and uh, gives me a nice smooth surface onto which I can put some finish. So uh, these are my two Lee Nielsen's. Um, I suspect I'm gonna have more soon having discovered these guys. So what I'm gonna do now is run through as quickly as I reasonably can, the uses for these players. So, obviously, the 45 degree plane, this is a piece of mahogany, can be used to edge join. This is bandsaw. I'm taking a very, very thin cut here. I'm gonna increase the cut slightly. For speed. Hear that lovely sound? The nice thing about the Lee Nielsen is it's just got a very smooth feel to it, and you feel that when you go slow, you have a lot of control. Okay, I, because you guys are watching and I'm Demoing. I'm not going to waste my time getting that perfect, but um, very good. Also, if you dial it back to where it was, um, so which one was this? Did I hear a question? Which of the planes was this? Which plane were you using? Just now? Yes. I was using the, the standard 45 degree okay. jet plane. Thank you. So that's that, the, the 45 degree is the most common kind of plane that people use in terms of 
I've, I've dialed that back a little too much. But it's, it's, a, it's actually, if you've got a nice flat surface, it's a really good smoothing plane. You see there? Maybe you don't, but let me get a couple more shavings and then I'll bring them. Piece up. That's against the grain. No, that's against the grain. No, that's with the grain. So it's taking some very, very fine shavings out. Um, and that's not the finest it can do. I've, I did one the other day that I could read newsprint. I didn't measure it because wood tends to squish. And anyway, it's an irre irrelevant number. But this is a, this is a beauty, really nice, nice plane. And while I'm on the subject of planes, there's some people put them on their sides, some put them on their, like that. I store them like that and I use them on my bench like that. People worry that the, the the blade will get nicked by pieces of metal on the, uh, on the bench. I'm a woodworker, so I don't usually have small pieces of metal. I find that having it on the side, it's very easy to nick it by banging a screwdriver or some other tool against it. So I tend to keep them like that. Um, and I keep them on my bench, because after all, they're bench planes. <laughs> so um, moving on to this guy. <coughs> This, this low angle plane has a, a you know, as I, as I mentioned, is a, a multi-use tool. One of the nicest uses for it is cleaning up. When you, when you uh, start cleaning water, you want this end to be square. Say you're doing dovetails, or, or as we are gonna do a rabbit in a minute. I'm gonna take my markings for that off of this flat edge. So that needs to be a really nice square flat edge. I can do it and have done it many times in the vise. You can do it that way. You have to watch out for tear out on the back end there as your plane goes past it. So you have to do it from here and then turn around and work from here. But uh, let's take this piece. I just bandsawed that yesterday. As you can see, there's a little burn there because my bandsaw blade's getting, getting old. But it's, it's a really nice, oh, that's not burn. That's where I've already put, a, put a, a plane on it. So anyway, I can do a reasonably straight line with a bandsaw, but I can't do it perfect. So to get it perfect, I put it in a shooting board. And if any of you guys are at a loss for something to do in the shop, you could make a shooting board for this plane. The features of a shooting board are that you're able to put the wood absolutely dead square across here, or if you have a mitered shooting board at 45 degrees, and that it has a step down here where the plane runs. There's a little groove right down here so that little shavings and dust and so on don't raise the plane up as you, as you work it. Um, and then there's a, a, a movable fence here so that I can set that in there and just run it without having to put any effort into keeping it this way. I've worked without one of these, and what I find is I end up starting to plane this edge over a bit, and, uh, and that needs to be squared. So I put my up against, up against there. The shooting board has a little lip down here. I get back up here, and that's got a, I'm set for a very, very thin cut there. I'm gonna go ever so slightly more. And when you put a plane up against a piece of wood that you think is straight, I don't know if you can see the gap there. I, yeah, you can see a little gap there. That's because the wood is not completely square on the end. So what we're gonna do, sit it in a, I'm gonna push these aside so I don't send one of those planes flying up the edge. Set it in the shooting board, just start working. A little pressure there to just push it to my right. You can see beginning to get it squared off. You know that this edge here is up against a piece of wood that is perfectly square. I would suggest don't glue it down, screw it down, because I've replaced this three times already. 
Um, you want to be constantly checking it with a square. Um, you can always make it proud and then use your plane to, to, to cut it down. All right. Now I have a really nice straight edge there. This is something I can use, I can mark off. I can mark a dovetail off this. So what I'm going to do is mark a rabbit off instead. I'm going to do two things. I want to mark the depth of my rabbit, and I want to mark how far in it is. I've preset the rabbit planes. I'm going to just run a marking, get a wheel gauge along here. And what I love about the wheel gauge is this is a very sharp blade um, and can be sharpened. You take it off and you sharpen it on the stone. Um, and it really is a sharp blade, so you don't need a lot of pressure to cut through grain. I've got two marking gauges set up for the, the speed. This one, I'm going to mark the depth of my cut. I mean, not the depth, well, the how far in I go. The reason I'm doing this with a marking gauge rather than a pencil is it's already cutting grain. So as my blade goes through here, the top part of the grain is already cut and I'm not going to get fuzzy edges because the edge is really critical when you're doing stuff like this. Whether, whether you're doing it with a router on the table or doing it something like this, but wait till you see what this guy can do. Okay, so I'm going to use this. It takes a little technique. I'm going too deep. I've set too deep. And you can, there's the parts that I was talking about. I, ha I had already set this too deep, so I'm going to go over to the other end. I'm going to just mark that. And then reset this easily set. I drop things, especially when I'm nervous. Question? A question. Yes. You have you've set the depth from your left to right, or excuse me, your right to left. So I see how the blade is cutting up to where you scored the board. But when it comes to your depth towards the bench surface, are you just having to periodically look, or is there a depth set on that as well? So you can't go below a certain depth. There is no depth set, however, okay. it will only cut one half inch. It is a, it, it's, it's, this is the Oh, gap. got it. It does have a removable foot. So if you're doing, say, um, a, 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 a stock data, you can take it and, well, while I've got it, I can show you. If you cut that data a 30 second of an inch too small, you can use this baby to expand it. Sweet. Okay, thank you. Um, but to you know, you have a maximum depth of half an inch. There. But no, that's you had before. Yeah, yeah. Because how, how many round? You know, would you rather do that than put a cat around and try and find a, a tiny shim? Okay, let's try see if I'm a bit more successful. And there's a left and a right handed. And we have fun. They come as a set. The reason for that is that it doesn't matter so much with end grain, but with, with uh, long grain, you'll often be working with a piece that maybe this one doesn't, but you get changes of direction in the grain. So if I were doing a rabbit along here, and here we get a change in grain because there's a knot or something there, I go back over. Take out my left hander and pull it towards me, or walk around the wood and, uh, and work that baby there. Oh, look at that! That's set such a fine cut. See, it's like I just enjoy doing that. I really don't like cutting things like rabbits with a tool like this. And it's a little quicker than setting up a router table. 
So let's go back to okay. I think you guys have seen enough of this of our rabbit planes. Any questions about any of the planes so far? Okay, how am I doing on time? Oh my god. Okay, I'm not gonna demo everything, but hey Paul, can I just comment that yes. If we're loving it, and I'm looking at people on the screen, they're loving it. Don't worry about your 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, if you guys are good with that, I just don't want to bore you. You're all not. I've got philosophy and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll then we'll move right along. Now. Um, okay, so uh, any questions about those rabbit planes? I, I, I they're, they're expensive. They're expensive, but I, I, you know, I would love to have these in my in my shop. They're just you know, such a handy little tool. There's so many times I want to do stuff like that. And uh, but they're Tom, available sorry, here at the shop. At the point. They are available here at the shop. So, you know, we really want to turn the shop into somewhere that hand tool workers can come to as well. We've got a whole classroom out there with, what, nine, ten benches? So, you know, feel free to come in, bring your own tools, donate the ones you don't use, all that stuff. Um, Paul, one quick question. question. I'm sorry. What is the model number of the rabbit plane that you're using? What are the numbers? Yeah, Easy the, numbers the to re remember. 99 and 98. Thank you. And they were Stanley planes originally. Um, you know, all of these numbers are, are the original Stanley pattern numbers, I think. So, um, Paul, question? Yes. Uh, maybe you're going to get into this later, but uh, are you going to talk about uh, how to keep rust away from planes and blades and things? Uh, I, I wasn't planning to, but I certainly can. Um, I don't. Where do you live, Pete? La Jolla? Huh? No, no. Uh, oh. Mosquitoes. <laughs> but, um, but basically, I, I live near here where we yeah. have the marine layer comes in day in, day out. Right. I, I tend to forget to put anything on my blaze and I haven't hit problems, but they're up on the wall and they're easily displayed. What I use is camellia oil. Yeah. You can use jojoba oil mm -hmm. or camellia oil. The nice thing about those oils is that they're what, they're, they, they set hard. So if you put camellia oil, oil on, it doesn't just evaporate and leave a greasy surface. surface. It, le it leaves something that's it's not as shiny as, as, as it looks without it, but, it, but um, you can put it on, on, on uh, steel and it really helps to keep, keep the rust off. But um, jojoba oil and camellia oil seem to be the favorites. You can get camellia at TH and H and jojoba yeah. oil you can get in the pharmacy, but they're just as expensive. Yeah, I, I use camellia oil, but sometimes, you know, rust, like they say in aerospace, rust never sleeps. And uh, it's hard to, uh, I mean, do you ever put things in bags? No, I have cabinets for most of my planes, except the bench planes. But I have all of my, all of my block planes, which, you know, including the, the wooden ones, uh, are many. <laughs> and they're yeah. all in one cabinet. And then I've got uh, all of my number five size, you know, this kind of size in, the, in another cabinet. Yeah. I think that helps. Um, any of you other guys got, got any uh, more, more effective ideas? Um, I do use in, in the shop, I use the, the WD-40 uh, silicon lubricant. Um, silicon? Yeah, the silicon, on things like um, uh, G-clamps, uh, you know, on the threads for G-clamps and on, on my planer and stuff like that. You gotta be uh, careful with silicon though because it can, uh, it can affect your finish. Oh, oh, for the, yeah, oh, if you're using them on tools, yeah, then I wouldn't use them on hand tools. I never have. Um, yeah, I use the paper and I store my planes in a drawer and I put that paper down that has a treated material in it. Oh, that, right. that really seems, I never had a problem with rust when I've done that. I use yeah. the oil, Camille oil and, uh, and yeah. the paper. Interesting. Yeah, I've never heard of that. So. Hey, hey, Paul. You can get it from Lee Nielsen. Oh, right. Uh, this is this is Doug real quick. So I use the extra fine Scotch Bright pad, and after I use my plane a couple of times, I'll just go over it with that, and then put the camellia oil back on it, and that will usually uh, fight the rust also. Uh, and I like Dallas. I when I store my planes, I have a little desk bag that I try to keep in the cabinet, 
and it helps draw the moisture too. And you could throw it in the microwave and it'll dry out the moisture and then you could put it back in where you store your planes. You just basically evaporate that moisture off and use it again. Huh? Exactly. Evaporate from the bag. Yes. Yeah. Cool. I, I use that desiccant, but I get anything that I buy and it has those bags in the little tea bag shapes. I just put them in there with the chisels and the hand planes. Cool. That makes sense. I also wax the sides and the bottom of my planes because they, that makes them work better as well. And Paul, do any of these materials that you use to protect against rust have an effect on wood that you might be working with or the wooden grips of the planes themselves? Do you have to worry about finish damage like with the silicon? With the silicon? Well, I don't usually use the silicon on my hand tools. I'm, okay. I'm talking about things like the, you know, the, the threads of G-clamps. For sure, for sure. So and, uh, um, I shouldn't have even mentioned it. <laughs> no problem. But those are really, that and some mineral oil, those are about the only lubricants I use in my shop. Okay, but none of the lubricants that you put on your hand planes that you mentioned just now will damage wood that you're working with? Not that I know of. No, okay. I've, I've thought about whether wax would, but I, if you polish the wax off after you apply it, and I just use beeswax and, and mineral, I gotcha. just mix the two together. If you can get mineral. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, what else? Oh, I was going to demonstrate the scrape plane. And just butt in with questions now because I'm, you know, I'm relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> this little guy needs to be used the right way around. <laughs> I've got that set a little heavy, and I'm not going to try and change it on camera. But I've still got to get used to this thing. But I did get it, I did hit a sweet spot the other day, and this, this works really nicely if you do it. But I think the key is to be taking very, very fine shavings. Doug, you've got a scraper plate yet. A larger one, don't you? Yes, I uh, you know, I have the small one. Uh, they they sell three sizes, and I have the uh, the medium, I'm sorry, the medium size. And how do you, any tips on using it? Because I found I had to get the blade, I followed Garrett Hack's method for sharpening, which, you know, is much the same as anyone else's. Um, but uh, I had to get really close up to the 90 degrees in order to get it to work in any kind of smoothness. Yes, that is correct. Cool. And do you use it much? Um, only when I'm going to have a particular finish. So when we had the finishing class with uh, Garrett Hack here um, during the, the September seminar, um, yeah. I brought it in. It was practically brand new. And when we tried it on polish, basically it's polishing a surface before you put other types of oil finish on. Um, it gave you a really nice uh level surface to put your finish on. I, I used it during that with, with uh, Doug. I used his, his plane uh -huh. during the Rogowski thing. And boy, it was sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of prompted a couple of guys to go out and buy one too. Ask Say again? It kind of prompted some other people to go out and buy one. Uh, <laughs> I think Mark is out there. He, uh, he went and bought one too. So. <laughs> and my wife's still mad at you, Doug. <laughs> Yeah, my wife's not even talking to him anymore. All the planes I bought because of him. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed that class. Yeah. How many planes does a man need, Paul? <laughs> That's a, don't you, it's is, a quote, is, do you answer Bill your wife's or <laughs> the answer, my friend? <laughs> Tune in Wednesday night, and I'll show you my hand tool cabinet. <laughs> Isn't the number always one more than you have? Yeah. Oh, exactly. I, I can't resist them, but I'm going to buy one of these. This is my next one, and. Yeah. Realistically, it might be the last bench plane I ever need. Um, yeah. I've got several bench planes. If this works out, I'll be uh, looking for somewhat suckers to buy my old ones. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 you, you, you bring me to a good point. I was going to, I just kept this as a little backup. 
another guy who's, who, who gave a class here, Gary Rogarski, um, he, he's, he's a very, very good woodworker, and he wrote this little book, Handmade, which I really enjoyed. Um, it made me come to his class. But anyway, he, he says, this is about woodworkers, and he say, it's in a chapter called You See It. It says, if you build things in wood, I know who you are. You love tools first. Your hands are drawn to them. Tools have magic in their grip. They hint at their potential about their capability, their promise, the power that lies in holding them. It's something old and atavistic, something real with smells from decades ago. Those tools that you love. And uh, he That's goes cool. on. He, 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 started, he was trained as a writer, so it's, it's interesting. But, but it's one of the few books that I've read that's more about the philosophy of woodworking rather than doing it. Although he talks about doing it. Interesting book. Um, you know, if you're only going to get a couple of planes, I, the two I use all the time are the two low angle, the, my low angle bench and my low angle jack. Yeah, this would be the best $500 you've spent in your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the time you pay shipping, this is about this guy is 253, or he was last night. And this this step goes steadily at 165. But uh, this, yeah, there's 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 there was a whole quality issue with planes. Basically, with the with the advent of machine tools for for woodworking, um, there was a, a you know, and, and the ability to mass produce cabinets and so on. There was a great um, lack of need for all of the good quality planes that, that Stanley had made over the years. So really post-war and even a little bit before the war, the quality began to go down. They started doing things like having steel knobs instead of brass knobs and um, just cutting corners in terms of castings and, and so on. Um, so they made weaker planes that were basically, they were good for do-it-yourselfers, and uh, to quote you, to, to, to give you a personal story, my father was a bit of a woodworker. He was a rather formidable man, so I never learned anything from him. Um, but I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. So when I told him in, in, shortly before I moved to America that I was interested in, in woodwork, he proudly gave me a... Uh, a brand new made in England Stanley plane that I could never, ever, ever get to work. It was 20 years or more before I even tried to make it work. And when I finally learned how to tune a plane up, I found I could tune it up, make it work, and it would go out of, out of tune just as quickly. Um, when Stanley moved their production to England, it was a complete waste of time. And just not a good plane. I, I, when I did the hand tool class, I thought, I got this English plane, it's a Stanley, it's got to be good. I took it in to uh, show it to Jennifer because she said, you've either got to buy the kind of iron that you need for this plane or bring in a, a good quality plane of your own. And I thought she'd look at it and go, yeah, okay. She didn't even pick it up. <laughs> she just said, I'd rather you don't bring that. You know, well, she was polite on that, but basically, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Once a plane is badly made, you can't fix it. And Stanley, I think, are trying to improve their quality at the moment. They're making a, a, some better planes, but I haven't tried them yet. They're making a sweetheart that's $100 less than this. Um, but there are two companies that have really picked up the quality plane challenge. Lee Nielsen, who used the old patents, and they, they, you, you only have to look at the difference, you look at the, the, the bulk of it and the, the, uh, the just the general look of quality. And then you put this on a piece of wood and, and, and it's, it's just like Rolls Royce. It's really smooth. Um, these guys and Veritas, who uh, they tend to be a little, little bit less expensive, but not much. What they do is they take the original designs and they modify them. So for example, in the low angle jack plane, they have um, little screws down here. So that once you've set the exact angle for your blade, because there's not much wiggle room here, you can keep it at that angle. So if you're using it just for, for, for you know, end jointing or something like that, then um, 
then uh, you do that. So um, there's, there are other companies coming in with quality stuff, but I, I haven't tried anything. Um, but if you're going to, Veritas or Lee Nielsen, I don't think you can go wrong with those. Would you guys agree? I certainly agree. Hey, Paul? Yes. This is Dwayne. Uh, I know that on the, it's either on the Lee Nielsen website or you can go to YouTube. They actually show how their planes are made. They've got a video that takes it through all the machining and shows the quality control that they put into them, et cetera. It's a real fascinating video. Oh, I have to see that. I'm not much of a tech guy, but I have to see that. Paul, speaking of tech, um, I actually put together that list of our current inventory of hand tools this week. So I can share that with you um, on via email if you are. Oh, excellent, John. Thank you very much. Ideas. Yeah, I can use that and we'll start working it up. Sure. Sounds good. That's great. Hey, Paul, maybe a plug for Lee Nielsen. They come up to Palomar College every January, the end of January. And yes, they do. It's, it's free shipping. Uh, you tell them you're a student, you get 10% off, and there's no tax. Absolutely, oh. yeah. They, and they do a great show. They, 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 um, I learned how to, uh, how to set, like this kind of blade, how to set it nice and flat. I, I can eyeball it, but I can't get it perfect. And uh, yeah, at that show, I learned how to how to get that perfect. You guys want me to demo it? Yes. Yeah, I do. <laughs> sure. All right. So basically, what they said was: first of all, take a look at this. Okay, so this baby is looks like the blade sticking out ever so slightly on my right hand side. What they said was take a nice thin piece of board and start in the middle. I don't know if you necessarily need to start in the middle, but what we're looking for is thickness of the shaving at the different points in the board. So I would expect from my visual inspection that this would be a heavier shaving. Not much, but I don't know why, but it's a little heavier on the left hand side here. So this is actually set up pretty nicely. I can, during the course of my thing, I can go all the way across and get a full width. But let's put it out of, camp, out of kilter. So now, if I go in the middle, very heavy shaving on that side, and it fades off on that side. So, that was the middle. If I do my right side, you can hear how much heavier a shaving that is. If I do the left side, there's almost nothing. So, what you do, in this case, the adjustment for the blade is a level. In the low angle, you got to loosen it off slightly and adjust it by hand. I wouldn't advise tapping it with a hammer because you tend to hit the body of the plane as well. So, now that's still, I've adjusted it and I went the wrong way. Very heavy cut on that. So, I'm going to adjust the lever towards the heavy side, right? With there are a few planes where you don't adjust to the heavy side, but normally if you want to remove the heavy side, you move the lever towards it. So that might have adjusted. Still pretty heavy. Let's look at the other side. Beginning to get a little shaving there. And again, you probably can't see it on camera, but that's a little thicker one side than the other. So I'll go a bit further towards the heavy side. And it's, it's a... I can tell that's still too heavy. So after a while, you get a, a feel. Fairly heavy that side. Fairly heavy that side. So I'm in the ball. Right? Those are shavings from both sides. Now, I'm gonna back this puppy up. What I'm getting there is just a very fine shaving in the middle, which is good with it backed up. Because now, 
I can go forward, and with these Lee Nielsen's, they don't take a lot. Once you take up the slack, as soon as you feel the pressure against the knob, you, you're talking like 60 fourths of a turn to, to change. Now I'm getting a slightly heavier. There, I'll check that my sides. It's a little heavy on the left side, a little heavy on the little light on the right side. So now I've gone a little heavy on the other side. I'm getting close. I'm getting very fine shavings out of both sides there. And a slightly heavier shaving in the middle, which is, as long as it's even on the edges, if it's a little heavier in the middle, that's good because that means the blade is already getting, put it, becoming a smoothing blade. You, you, I'll, we'll go into the trick for make, turning a, a, a plane into a smoothing blade. Uh, another time. Anyway, once I've got that, I'm getting beautiful, almost see-through shavings. I could probably read newsprint through that. Anyway, this, and, and that's probably not the finest, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but not the finest cut. What I really like about these planes is you can go from a heavy cut to a fine cut without too much of, a, of, of tuning up and, fit, and fiddly. Um, all right, next question. This is beautiful, beautiful, smooth surface. I, I could put finish straight on. Yeah, another question. Yes. When do you find yourself going for the low angle plane versus the normal 45? Well, I don't own the low angle, but Absolutely, I would use it. I have used this low angle for jointing on here. As you can see, it'll work. I'm gonna get my, my fence in a little. Actually, I can't get a fence to this because it's it, there's, there's not a big enough gap there. But um, I have used this. Anytime, what, what low angle excels at is putting a finish on if you're going with the grain. If you're going against the grain, then You've got some issues, but uh, there are ways to deal with that. Um, and it really, really excels at doing end grain. I mean, the, the, the end grain cut on this thing, I, I, uh, it's, it's just really smooth. I wouldn't put sandpaper on that. I'd just use that as it is because, you know, sandpaper will actually take it away from being straight. Um, if I, when I have my low angle with the different blades, this would, what would be a, I'd use this pretty much universally if I were traveling or something like that. You know, if you're at home, you've got all the blades you, you need. But, uh, um, but using one of these, the, uh, it's really, really good. You bring it back to a very, very fine shaving. That's a fairly fine shaving there. I'm gonna just, the thing about this mahogany is it's, it's got that, that alternating grain. So the key to that, and it's in this article in, in Fine Woodworkers, is I, I mentioned this last week with the, with the little block plane. Just taking little slices like that. Didn't do it very successfully that way. Let's take a look at the grain. I'm against the grain. No wonder I'm getting bad results. You see those beautiful, they're almost shiny, those shavings. It, this, is, this really excels at preparing for finish. And I see that you default <laughs> to an angled push as opposed to a straight on push down the wood. With I'm the sorry? Plane. Seems like you always angle the plane as you push down the wood as opposed to going straight on. Yeah, the reason I started doing that was basically because I, I found straight on will work a lot of the time, but um, a lot of times if you've got any contrariness in the grain, that'll just accentuate it. My body just seems to like being like this, and I've found that working the blade like that, even when I'm not doing edge grain sometimes. Edge grain is a time when I usually want to be dead straight, but if I'm doing rough stuff, I'll still 
still go across at the angle. Plus, I find that it's easier for me to keep the plane level like that rather than like that. Um, and this it just sort of fits with my body mechanics. But, but uh, basically, what happens is when you take a blade, and especially a low angle blade like this, and you, so it's already at a low angle, so it, 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 it can cut. Um, can't best describe my, my a loss for words, but it, it, it's, it's already at a low angle. And what it does is it reduces the friction as you cut the wood. When you turn it like this, it makes it effectively an even lower. And you get little shavings like this. Um, but the reason I started doing that was that 1980s English, fine English Stanley plane that is in my storage and will probably remain there for the foreseeable future. Um, that thing was just a, it, it wasn't a very good plane. And so I started finding that I could, I, I could improve the quality of what I was getting like that. This thing though, I mean, I just want to keep playing this all day long. It just, it just <laughs> you can see what, what a plane. Um, anyway. Maybe we should just leave it low, the piece of wood and the plane, and you can just continue to do that. I'm sorry? <laughs> What'd you say? I was teasing you that perhaps we should leave you alone with the piece of wood and the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shave it down to nothing. Yeah. No, I do plenty at home, believe me. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how you guys feel about, about wood and so on, but it's just been the finest thing in my life, apart from, you know, my beloved. And by beloved, do you mean Lee Nielsen hand plane? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, my beloved's from Boston, not me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, any other comments, suggestions, input? I've got, I've got something I want to suggest, but I want to hear from you guys. I just want Obviously, to... you were going to show your, your grooving plane, right? We can't hear you, Rod. You're muted. Can't read lips. Can you unmute, Rodney? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, if, if you have time, or you can wait till the next time. There's no rush. Uh, it's up to you guys. Go I think these guys have not, I, I don't know where, if they have places to go, but I don't. So. <laughs> okay, so. Let's see it. What you got? A, um, can you guys see it? Yes. Okay, so it's a Veritas. Uh, they call it a small plow plane. It's got a fence here. I added an auxiliary fence because it, if you just go with this one, it won't stay square. And you're constantly trying to, to get your groove to stay a groove. Um, these two here adjust the fence. And it is notorious for coming loose, so you have to tighten it up. It, it moves the fence this way in and out. This one is the depth stop, so you can set the depth of the groove. It currently has a 1 8 inch uh, blade in it. A little higher, Rodney, we can't see it. There you go. It currently has a 1 inch 8, one inch eight blade. One, sorry, <laughs> 8. This is the depth stop. Again, this is the, uh, oh. the how far in you want to go. And the blade is adjusted in and out over here. Uh, I added the, the uh, fence, additional fence, because it, it just wants to sit and do this. Uh, you don't hold it this way. Um, you tend to want to just push uh, rather than grip it. Even if you did that, you, you really want to just focus on pushing it this way. And it Other than that, it works great. Uh, I tend to put my hands down here, and really the focus needs to be down and in, uh, rather than straight and level. And this just wants to push. And it took me a while to get in the habit of not even putting my hand around it and just doing this. But I've got a, I don't know if you guys can see all the way over there, uh, but can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. 
So when I first got it, I started out planing out here, and it just rips it to pieces. You actually want to start at the end and bring it back. Oh. It's pretty much like any other plane. You just want to kind of rock it back and forth. But you really want to focus on pushing in and, and this way. If you, if you try to do it like that, it's going to move. And that's the worst, you know, best way to keep it flat is to actually put your hand down here and push that, it. Yes, yeah. And that's more important than, than even going forward. And after that, you just rock and roll with it. When it hits the depth stop, it quits planing. Uh, they make a right and a left. Uh, some people buy both, so if they're going against the grain, they can just switch to the other plane. I didn't do that. It's the groove's never seen, so if it's got a little bit of tear out in the bottom, it's just not that important. So, but I take really light shavings, and it's one of my favorite planes as far as doing joining. I prefer to do grooves with this over the router any day, uh, particularly if I've only got a couple to do. That's kind of on the ears and the, 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 the lungs and everything, isn't it? What's that? It's much kinder to your ears and your lungs. Oh, everything. I mean, it's just a joy to use. I mean, I hate routers. They're just noisy, dusty, dirty. <laughs> uh, by the time I set one up, I can have already made five grooves with this thing. Uh, but, and I feel that way about just any piece of machine. I, I prefer the hand tools uh, any day. But if I have three of them to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the router. But Rod needs to have a couple of knickers on there to, to cut it before it pauses. Well, no, this one doesn't have a knicker, uh, oh. because it's it's always going. It's only a groove plane. If it won't cut cross grain, uh, the cross grain one is their. Uh, hang on. This is a moving philister plane, which is also made by, it's my only two Veritas planes, but it does have a knicker right here. A little higher, Rodney. On a cross grain. We can't see it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, this is the other one they make, and it does have a knicker up forward, and it's for going across grain, but it's not a grooving plane. It's more of a rabbit plane for cross grain mm -hmm. cutting. Uh, this thing is a pain in the ass. Uh, it, it, it's... I cuss at it more than anything else, and, and if you don't have an auxiliary fence on this, it's just going to go all over the place. It's really hard to get a flat, square rabbit with this thing. Uh, and you can go online, and there will be a hundred different suggestions on what you're doing wrong. But it's, <laughs> it's mainly hard to set up. It's got all kinds. This has to be perfect across the, the blade. It has to be perfectly parallel to this sole, or it won't cut uh, correctly. And you just get unevenness all around. It's like a lot of any other plane, you have to start heavy in the front or downward. And then as you move across, you want to put the weight to the back, just like any other plane, or you get this banana on your rabbit. So it's, I don't like it much. <laughs> is that a skew blade? Yes, it is. Oh it, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're fun to get set up on. Yeah, it's a move, it's called, they call it, uh, a skew rabbit plane, it's basically it's a moving philister plane. Right. Because it's got a fence and it's got the, the skew, the, uh, the blade up front for cutting the fibers. But one day we'll get along, but right now we're not. <laughs> I like the way you put that. <laughs> that gives me an idea for a suggestion or a question, Paul. I would yes. love to see a video lesson from you on the basics of joining or maybe a series on the basics of joining with hand planes and hand tools. Yeah, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, I took a, a semester long class to do that. And the first three weeks were sharpening. But uh, no, I, I, I think, um, yeah, you, we, should, we should start to do that. I'm, I'm a, 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 a total novice at this video thing and I have to get all my errors out first. <laughs> I think you did fine. Can I just give some feedback as a guy who has watched the progression in the shop? Uh, the audio is just remarkably better from our early ones in the shop. So Dallas, whatever changes we've made, it worked out really, really well. And zooming in closer, especially when magical mystery hands 
when Dallas, you were holding things in front of the camera, boy, we could really see it clearly on our end. So there were some really great improvements in terms of the way this thing comes across as a Zoom audience. Uh, I just, we were able to get a lot out of it. The one place that sounded weird was, I guess when we heard ourselves on your end, it was, the evidence was Paul leaning forward and not hearing and understanding us. There was some sort of echo or feedback or something. I, I was just having different, I have hearing difficulties anyway, and any background noise no, but from our end, cloud me out. So don't, no, you know. No, 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 from, from our end, I think Rodney was agreeing. Um, other people, could you by- You got garbled. Garbled, yes. Yeah. Oh, right. In terms of thumbs up, is that what people uh, saw? Yeah. Yeah, we got a real world thumbs up from Pete. So whatever, whatever it was, I mean, I just wanted to give feedback because it is so much better in the current setup for viewing and for audio from the presenter. But when it came to us hearing other people in the audience, it was still not quite there. And I just, I just wanted to give feedback as just a member of the audience here. It's, it's so much better now from just when Paul is talking and we're watching, it's really good. I didn't think it was everybody, like I hear you just fine. It was just every now and then, whoever was talking, it just sounded like it was just garbled. Uh, and then when it never happened when Paul was talking. Right. right, Paul was clear as a bell. I think that we were somehow pick, uh, being broadcast through the speaker in the shop. And then we were hearing that looped back in through Paul's oh, audio. Oh, I think that's what it is, yeah. So if we have, were able to mute, my monitor here then we'd, we'd stop that feedback or if the monitor went to the speaker then maybe it wouldn't feed feedback either right because it's not happening right now as we toggle among people but when we were on spotlight uh dallas could you just spotlight paul right now and then maybe one of us can talk and see if we can recreate it okay so how does this sound to all of us there's a bell yeah, yeah it's better fine. very clear very clear yeah much different from before <laughs> yeah is there something different dallas that we just did because that is very clear no we haven't changed the thing no he, he hasn't touched any technology i'm, I'm playing with a plane actually <laughs> <laughs> well regardless oh, huh. just just so they had some feedback that's all because i mean the 99 percent of it was just fantastic and yeah great yeah thanks yeah. paul yeah, well, we, yeah, well, we, you know, I think um, it, it is good. The technology is getting better and better. And I wonder if perhaps if we had just one of those little bell uh, mics. Where are we at on that? I thought we were going to order one of those. No, we don't know what to, I don't know what to order, Rob. You figure it out, I'll, I'll get one by. Which plane is that on the board right now? Huh? What plane is on the board right now, yes. Oh, that's my segue. When you guys are ready. Ready. Okay, are you ready? Okay, so I've got, I've got a couple of things I wanted to say. If anybody would be inclined to make a shooting board, there's a really nice design on Lee Nielsen. I use bits of scrap that I got out of a, a, a lumber yard. Um, but uh, it's, it's a simple piece of equipment to make. If, I, if you make one, I'd suggest you make two, one for the shop and one for us. You can uh, also make it so that it'll work for a lefty by just having a, an additional platform over here. Um, so that's my first challenge. And then the next thing is more of a question. Um, Rod and I would talk, I'm not sure if you'd mind being called Rod, Rodney. I, I, I'll answer to anything. No answer to anything. Okay, great. Um, one of the neatest classes I ever took was the art and craft of plane making. And Rod and I were talking about uh, Krenoff planes the other day. And I just wanted to throw it out. Would you guys be interested in maybe uh, building yourselves a plane? Absolutely. Thumbs up, yep. Yes. <laughs> All right. 
Well, I think even, you know, I think even if, if uh, yeah, so at least three people. Um, they're not that difficult to make. They're not as difficult as European um, planes, are, as, as European wooden planes are to make. Um, if you have the Fine Woodworking Archive, issue number one has an article written by James Krenoff about how to make a Krenoff plane. So it doesn't get much closer to the horse's mouth than that, considering he's passed away. Um, this was the first one I made. It's, um, it has a hock blade. And uh, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, start working. I'll see if I can find some, some written information um, to, to email out to you guys. Um, we may make a slight modification. Instead of having a square pin, we might have a round pin because the square pins are a nightmare to get, to get absolutely lined up. But it's a remarkably easy plane to make. You can make it from one block of wood. I made it from, three, from two because I wanted a fancy side to it. But uh, they, they, when you tune them up just right, they're really nice. What was the name of that book you had up earlier? The book? Yeah. Oh, handmade. Thank you. That's Thank the one. Do we have it available for sale? We have it available in the shop. Here. Don't bother buying it. I'll give you mine. Okay, okay. great. It's a, it's you know it's it's it, all books are you know to in the individual taste, but I enjoyed reading it. It's not a very long read, but uh, I had a book token. This was a couple of years ago. I had a book token that I hadn't spent. So. Yes, I've got a spare as well. Yes. This is this is the one I originally. We've bought. got a bunch of them in the shop. Yeah. If you like to hike, you'll enjoy his his book as well. Who is the author of the book? Gary Rogowski. Oh, okay, thank you. Same gentleman who's who's got that article in today's in this current fine woodwork. Is here's the Lee Nielsen 2019 catalog. They'll send it to you if you ask them to. Um, but they have a quite a range of tools. Hey, Paul, I have a question about restoring planes. I know yes. you've restored some planes. Some of the ones that I have gotten from the old tool swap meet, the handles are broken. Do you have a source of replacement handles? Yeah, it's called a bandsaw. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> That's what I thought, but I just uh, thought I'd ask. What, what plane in particular? Uh, I have some number fours, Stanley, Bailey, number fours, and number fives. We might have one or two old spare parts lying around the shop somewhere, I'm not sure. But uh, you can look online, people tend to sell parts of these things for ridiculous money. You know, I thought, saw a tote for, a, oh God, I saw somebody selling a box for a Lee Nielsen for like $18. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that's, I, I keep that box and, you, and put other tools in it. <laughs> exactly, okay, thank you. But uh, yeah, um, I, I do think I may have some, some templates, I'm not sure. But you can always take the broken one, trace around it, and then make something pretty close. Okay, thank you. Most of the oldies were made out of rosewood, but uh, European beech or even maple will work reasonably well. And I'm sure there's, there's got to be someone out there making, you may even find it on like uh, Highland Woodworking or something like that. that maybe someone selling totes. If not, you may have a, a new business. Exactly, thank you. Dallas is going to work on this plane here. Any other questions, suggestions? I'll, uh, I'll uh, work on uh, getting some information together for this, for the, uh, the plane, for the uh, Krenoff plane and uh, Next time, uh, I haven't exactly decided what to do next time, but uh, there's, there's such a, a, I got such a lot of good feedback after the last one, um, but uh, I don't want to just focus on planes, so I don't want to just bring in a bunch of wooden planes, but uh, um, what would you guys like the next subject to be? Like say between squaring a board, um, Looking at some of the other hand tools, marking out, um, saws. Oh, there is one other thing I'd like to show you guys. Um, Mike, would you would you be able to throw out that photo, those photos I, I, I sent you? Hey, Paul. Uh, so one of the problems about 
although I've been coming into the shop, I've been doing things that are shop related, not personal related. And um, one of the things that the, the problems I encountered was that uh, I'm making something that requires, uh, requires spines. It's a, it's a um, mitered box and requires splines. So I don't have access to a, a, a source stock and I don't have access to, um, oh, there we go. And I don't have access to um, a, a flat top blade or anything. So my plans to use the shop were kind of stymied. So what I did was, I, these boxes, I, you know, you can see they're fairly thin and they're mitered at the corners, so they need a little support. What I did was I, I, I took my, this was my father's, um, took his uh, Spear and Jackson European saw and I laminated some veneers to the exact thickness of the curve and then cut 120 curves, marked and cut 128 curves on that. And uh, Darryl's, uh, Dallas is wincing. I don't know if you can see the photograph. <laughs> But that was the result there. And that's given me some design ideas just taking that picture. But uh, I've now cut them down and they're almost invisible. But uh, I figured that, that the, oh, that's that, oh, there you go. See, that's quite a neat, neat line, that line along the, uh, the splines there. But uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun to cut down and, and make sure you didn't break any grain and so on. But, but uh, have it I gave me some really good practice with European swords. Have I mentioned how much I like my domino? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> some of us, different strokes for different folks. No, actually, the dominoes are no, it's, it, it, I mean, it, 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 it's probably much stronger than these, you know. The reason I put so many in is because I, because, you know, the whole principle is to get some long grain in. It's more long range, long range. But can, those are, sorry? Yeah. That's what I found on my bench at 10 o'clock last night. <laughs> There's a bit of a shot. Wow. He's about three inches long. Oh my no, God. Two and a half inches long. It's a heck of a moth. I didn't know we had that in San Diego. No, I was real startled. I think I've seen a few dead ones in the past, but I've never seen a live one. I just picked him up on that piece of paper and put him outside the garage door when I went to bed. But, uh, but yeah, he was, he was uh, quite a surprise. Must have come in because of the light. Hey, Paul, just one uh, suggestion going back to your ideas for other topics. Yes. Uh, while the audience is probably only overlap partially. Uh, Doug has done recent classes on both marking and on squaring. Uh, and he's gonna be transitioning to a, a, an ongoing project, so it won't see those topics overlapping, but I think at least a few of people on this group were in those sessions that Doug did. And so marking and squaring are probably things that would be probably repetitive. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much of an audience overlap there is. How many people were there when Doug did his fast start? Maybe you could indicate by showing a thumbs up. Okay. They, yeah, I, I was, you know, I, I thought maybe down the road we'll do, do the uh, squaring the board. But a lot of that, the marking out and so on, would come if we start doing any kind of joinery stuff. Makes sense. You know, perhaps we would... Uh, you know, we might try to do something along the lines of an online mortise and tenon joint uh, class or something like that. Cool. I don't know how we'd work that, but uh, I'm open to ideas. Well, Paul, I think the one thing that we still have to do some work on, but would I think be have wide value to our membership is a session on some sessions on sharpening. Definitely. We have, we have to do some work on figuring out what their standards can be and we'll, maybe we can engage some of the members of this group in yeah. doing that. But we have to get uh, settled on what, which way we're going to teach it and then, uh, then start doing some, some work with that. Yeah, really, because sharpening is, is the key. And, and I never got, until I learned how to sharpen and tune up a plane, I never got satisfactory results. Cool. Um, and, and even today, sharpening, I, I, I frequently mess it up. <laughs>
Okay. All right. Well, then I will uh, we'll talk about that, and I'll see if I can at least in introduce an element of sharpening. You know, even if it's just sharpening the back of the chisel and stuff. Cool. Great job, Paul. Yeah. yeah thanks, Paul. This yeah. was awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it was great as always. Oh, well, thank you, guys. And thanks, my apologies to Doug. I did mean I, I thank you, uh, Travis, for plugging Doug's thing because uh, I meant to meant to plug Doug's. Uh, um, uh, fast stop program. Well, let's also then plug what uh, Doug is heading towards. Doug, are you still out there? I am. Can you tell us what's coming up in Fast Start? Uh, we're going to carry on from what Paul has showed us today. Uh, we're going to start building a, a small hanging wall cabinet, uh, something really simple out of pine. Uh, it's mostly for uh, very beginning woodworkers. But uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, um, we're going to go over the plans for the project and we're going to rough cut our sides and shelf and start to do some layout for joinery. Sounds um, great. Are you expecting that we would, uh, those of us who want to follow along would know in advance to go buy what would and then just be able to keep up with you? Or are you doing this mainly as a demo? Uh, mostly as a demo, but I, I, if you would like to follow along, um, I'll see if I could put something out uh, today or tomorrow on what I plan to lay out for the next six weeks and what the material list is going to be. Wow, fantastic. Wow. That would be really useful because then I can, I can be sure that I'm not going to, um, you know, double do it in a week or something like that. Yeah, so. yeah. Yes, sir. That's great. You might actually be able to complement each other if you did something that Yes, absolutely. Show something about a tool he's going to use during that week. Yeah, yeah. Compliment as in, like, compliment as in, Paul, you have a lovely T-shirt with a wolf on it. Is that kind of? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I, I would run out of superlatives for Doug. So. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great, Paul. I've really enjoyed it, folks, and uh, you know. Do feel free to come back and, and give us some feedback. Let let me know if you have special. Uh, you know, special desires or even a desire to present something, you know? Right. The, the way Rod did. Yeah, absolutely. That no, I, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's nice. We all have our favorite tools. And um, I, I, I found that, you know, when you just look at pictures of tools and you don't see them being used, they, they're just pretty, you know. But when you see them actually being used, then you, you realize, yeah, this is something I can do.